Welcome to this accounting masterclass. In this class, we're going to focus on the cash flow statement. In this class, we're going to look at the principles of the cash flow statement and how to prepare a cash flow statement. And then in later classes, we'll work through exam questions which require us to prepare the cash flow statement. So before we look at the cash flow statement in detail, we need to have a quick recap on how financial statements are prepared. So we know that we have our P&L and our SFP as our two main financial statements. And they report all of the transactions or the P&L reports all of the transactions, so the income and expenses and the SFP shows the assets and liabilities. Now we know that every time a transaction occurs, we won't record it directly on the financial statements because there are lots and lots of transactions throughout the year. So instead, for each amount, we'll have a ledger account. And then for each ledger account, we'll summarize all of the transactions for the period. We'll get the final balance and we'll see if it's a debit or credit. And then we'll summarize all the debits and credits on the trial balance and then we can transfer the balance from the trial balance into the financial statements. So if we just remind ourselves on some common transactions, if the company makes a sale during the year, it will record revenue. So therefore, if they've made a sale for cash of 200, we'll credit revenue so here we are crediting revenue and we're referencing here that the other side of the entry will go to cash. So therefore we'll debit cash the other side and that's referencing that the credit side is in revenue. Now if we make a sale and the customer hasn't paid us yet, so we've made a sale on credit, they're gonna pay us in the future. Then we've still made a sale, we'll still credit revenue. But the other side, rather than going to cash because we haven't received any cash, it will go to receivables. Now at the end of the year, we can see what do we have on our revenue account, so in our sales ledger. We can see that we've made sales for 500. There weren't any debits, so there weren't any adjustments for you know, discounts or refunds or anything like that. So therefore we can see that Overall, we've got a credit of 500. So we've got 500 on this side and we have nothing on this side. So therefore we balance it off by entering 500 here. And that's the balance which is transferred to the TB. So you can kind of think of this as, you know, closing the ledger account off and transferring that balance to the TB. So we're like debiting the ledger account, the nominal account, and then crediting the TB. But really what we're doing is just looking at our sales and saying, well, we made sales of 500, there weren't any debits, so therefore we've got a credit of revenue on 500. So the reason that you have the balance on this side is just to close this off. And therefore from our trial balance, you can then transfer it to the financial statements. If we then look at our receivables, this of course is a balance sheet account so it'll have a brought forward and a carried forward. Whatever the carried forward from last period was, so the 550 is the brought forward for the current period. So we've got receivables brought forward. So at the end of last year, customers owed us 550. We've made sales on credit of 300. So our customers owe us an extra 300. So that causes the receivables to go up. Now, if we know that the carried forward for receivables is 750, then our customers must have paid us cash of 100. Or if we knew the brought forward and the sales in the year on credit and we knew that they'd paid us 100, we could work out the carried forward. So you could always work out, if you're only missing one number from these tier accounts, you can always work out what it is. So therefore our customers paid us some money, so credit receivable because they no, no longer owe us that 100 and then we'll debit cash. Quite straightforward. 
And then you've got your receivables carried forward balance, which we'd record down here as a debit because it's an asset. And we close that account off by having to enter something on the credit side. So therefore we'll have a debit here because our debits were more than our credits. And then we just transfer that from the TB to our receivables. And we'll have a similar thing with purchases. So we buy some goods during the year, but rather than paying for them, we buy them on credit. So these are our purchases, which we know of form part of our cost of sales, cost of sales, opening inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory. So we have our purchases, so we'll debit our purchases, but we didn't pay for the goods, so we don't credit cash, we instead credit payables. And therefore you've got your purchases figure for the year, more debits and credits, you're gonna have a debit on your TB, which is what you'd expect for purchases because it's an expense, you've purchased goods, from a supplier to sell them. And if we had a bought forward on our payables, our payables were increased from the goods we purchased in the year on credit, so goods we purchased which we haven't sold yet. And then we've got our carry forward amount and nothing was actually paid to our suppliers. So therefore we've got our carried forward amount here of 500. So again, if you know what the brought forward is and the amount which increased or decreased the balance during the year, then if you've also got your carried forward and you know what cash will be, it will just be like the balancing figure. Equally, if you're preparing the financial statements and you know cash and you can get your carried forward balance here. So it's really important that you kind of understand how these T accounts work. So then we could have admin expenses. So if we had an admin expense of depreciation of the head office of 100, we know that you debit the P&L, so we debit our admin expenses and you would credit the carrying amount of the asset because the asset's gonna go down in value. So you've got your bought forward amount for your assets at the end of last period. Every year they'll depreciate, which reduces the value of the asset. And then you have the debit in the PL, the expense, the expense of writing off the asset over its useful life. And if we know that this is the carried forward, because we know what the carried forward balance is for the SFP, or if we knew that we had cash additions of 200, we could then work out the carry forward. But if you know the bought forward, the current year depreciation charge, and the carried forward, then that must be the cash additions to make this balance to get to your carried forward amount. So we'll have our admin expense in our TB, the debit, and we'll have our PPE carried forward as our debit. So more debits than credits. Now you could show your PPE amount, we've shown it kind of net here, the carrying amount, of course the carrying amount is made up of the cost minus the accumulated depreciation. So rather than showing it kind of net with all the PPE amounts included here, you could have them separate, showing the cost and the accumulated depreciation separately. So if the previous year was the first year we bought the asset, that would have been its cost. There wouldn't have been any accumulated depreciation. The depreciation charge goes to accumulated depreciation to leave you with a carry forward here because you've got more credits and debits. So you've got a credit on your accumulated depreciation, which is of course reducing the asset. And then you've got your assets at cost. So the net amount of course will be the 1,100, which is the carrying amount. So that's its carrying amount is simply just made up of its cost minus any previous year's depreciation. So we've got the assets cost of 1,200. We've got the accumulated depreciation, which is just the current year depreciation because there wasn't any depreciation in previous years. And therefore we get to the carrying amount. 
And then we could keep coming down with all different types of expenses. We might have finance expenses. So of course we're gonna have a debit to our expense, which will end up in the P&L. And then that will increase the liability if we haven't actually paid it yet. If we had paid it, we would of course credit cash rather than liability. Similarly with the cash additions, if we've acquired additions of 200 and we paid cash for them, then we'll debit assets because we've got some new assets and we'll credit cash if we paid cash for them. If we hadn't paid cash for them and we bought them on credit, you'd credit payables, possibly trade payables. So we can see just a recap here of the principles of how we, the process of accounting and preparing the financial statements. So when we identify our tax expense for the year, we'll debit tax expense, and that will of course end up as a P&L expense. If you've paid your tax, then you're gonna credit cash. If you haven't paid your tax, then you'll credit tax payable, which is what you can see we've done here. Of course, with all of these balance sheet amounts, these assets and liabilities, you'll have a port forward liability. And then that will increase or decrease in the year, depending on what's happened during the year. And then the cash will reduce the liability to get you to your carry forward. So it's important to understand how these work because you can see that in every tier account or in most tier accounts, you've got a cash amount. So whilst we'll see the other side of the entry in the cash tier account, you won't be given this in an exam question and therefore you can work out the cash amounts just by looking at the other side of the entry. So when we looked at this, when we received some money from our customers, one side is in the cash account, but we can see that the other side is in the receivables amount. So therefore you could work out the cash movement just by looking at your receivables account and with your PPE account, looking at your cash additions. With your interest payable, if you know what the bought forward is, how much it increased in the year because of your additional interest expense, and if you know what the carried forward is, then this must be the cash amount because your T account must balance. So we can think about some other examples as well. If we think about share capital, we've got our bought forward share capital, so this is our ordinary shares, we've got our brought forward amount. Now if we know that the carry forward amount is higher, then they must have issued some new shares. Now they could have issued new shares via a bonus issue. If it was a bonus issue where they've given the shareholders new shares for free, then no cash is received. But if it's not a bonus issue and they've been issued for cash, then that increase in share capital must also result in an increase in cash. So you'd credit share capital and the other side would be debit cash. And of course, we only credit share capital by the nominal amount of the shares. So if they were one pound shares, you would just credit the share capital by the nominal amount. If the shareholders paid an amount above the nominal amount, that will go to the share premium. So if you've got an increase in the share premium as well, then the total amount that they paid for the shares must be the 150. Because your share premium, that's the bought forward, if that's the carried forward, it must have gone up because shares were issued for an amount above the nominal amount. So that was a nominal amount received for the share issue that the shareholders put into the company. They also paid a premium as well, so therefore the total cash amount was 150. So when we look at our retained earnings, again, we can look at what was the bought forward on our retained earnings? What causes retained earnings to go up in the year? Well, of course, it would just be our profit for the year. That's what retained earnings is. It's the profits from previous years plus the profit from the current year minus any dividends paid. So any dividends paid, of course, will be a cash amount. So you'll debit retained earnings 
because some of those earnings which belong to the shareholders are now being paid out to them. So their retained earnings have reduced because they've actually received some of those retained earnings. And the other side will go to cash. And that'll get us to our carried forward amount. So it's worth just having a recap on how the financial statements are prepared. We summarize transactions in these ledger accounts and therefore we just get the final balance at the year end on each ledger account. That goes to our trial balance and then we can take the numbers from the trial balance and put them into the financial statements. So we know of course that these financial statements are pre prepared on an accruals basis, not on a cash basis. You can think of them kind of being complete opposites. So of course this revenue here doesn't represent the amount of cash we earned or we received from our customers. It's the sales we made to them, the value of the sales, regardless of whether they actually paid us or not. So we know that we made sales in a period of 500, the customers only paid us for 200 of those sales, 300 they haven't paid us for yet. But we still record that as revenue because we've still earned that income in the year. We've provided them with the goods and services. So therefore we've earned it, so we record it as revenue in this period. That's the whole principle of the accruals basis. It's like with these admin costs, we know that just includes a depreciation charge. So we haven't paid out any cash here. We haven't purchased PPE of 100 or anything like that. We bought some PPE you know, last year or at the start of this year, whenever it was. So perhaps at the end of last year. So we purchased the PPE at the end of last year and we're going to record the expense. So we're going to recognize it as an asset because it's got a 10 year useful life. We're going to use it over 10 years. So we won't record it as an expense when we buy it. We'll record it as an expense over the 10 years. That's applying the accruals concept. You buy an asset for a thousand, you're going to use it over 10 years. You record the expense over 10 years. So every year you reduce the value of the asset by crediting it and you debit the expense in the PL because you're recognizing it over the life of the asset. So again, we've used the accruals basis. And again, with our finance costs, we may have looked at the loan and we may have a £1,000 loan at a 3% interest rate. And therefore, we would say, okay, well, the interest we've incurred in this period is 30. £1,000 loan at 3%. That's the interest we've incurred, regardless of whether we've actually paid the interest. That's what we've incurred. The conditions of the loan are you have to pay 3% interest. So therefore we'll recognize it as an expense, even if we didn't pay the interest in this year, we could have paid more or less than that. Similarly with tax, this is the tax on the profits in the year, possibly a prior year adjustment as well, if last year's figure was correct. But we might not actually pay that tax until after the year, but we still record it as an expense now. We use the accruals basis to prepare the P&L so that we show what income and expenses were earned and incurred during the year, not what cash was paid. But of course, you know, cash is very important to a business. If you don't have enough cash, you won't be able to keep the business going. You need the cash available there to pay your suppliers. So even if you're a profitable business, if you run out of cash, you will still go out of business because you fail to pay your suppliers. They will stop supplying you and may take you to court. So therefore we do also prepare a cash flow statement. So we're also going to prepare a cash flow statement showing how much cash has gone into the business. So there are different ways of doing this and you could think, well, the easiest way in practice would just be to go and see what's gone into the cash account and then put all the balances there in the right places. Of course, that's one way that you could go about doing it, but in an exam question, what you will nearly always get is the P&L and the SFP, and you have to work out from these what a cash amounts are. So if you firstly look at the cash flow statement, it summarizes 
itself under three sections. You've got cash from operations. And I would think of this as the cash from your operating activity. So basically you're buying and selling. Yeah. Your P and L if you like. So you're selling goods to customers, mine is kind of your expenses um, from doing like day to day business. That's what I think of. Think of that as this is kind of like the cash from your operating activities and P&L kind of summarizes your operating activities. Then you've got cash from investing activities. So you buying things, what have you spent out buying things? Well, I think of that as your assets. Okay. If you're investing, if you're spending money on stuff, then that should obviously end up with you having an asset. So therefore this will be show the cash movements on all of our assets. So buying PPE, selling PPE, etc. So mainly looking at these non-current assets. And then we've got financing. So a business finance itself, it raises money in one of two ways, it either borrows money or borrows assets or raises equity from shareholders. So we can look at this section as being your non-current liabilities and your equity. So that's the way I would think about this section. So we are going to go through every balance on our financial statements and just say what was the cash movement from this. So if it's anything to do with the kind of P&L operating activities, we'll show it in cash from operations. If it's cash inflows and outflows from buying and selling assets, we'll show it in cash from investing activities. And if it's cash coming in and out from liabilities, non-current liabilities and equity. So maybe you know, issuing new shares or paying dividends or borrowing money, or setting up loans. Then we'll show it as cash from financing activities. So once you break it down like that, it makes it a little bit more manageable. So as I said, in the exam question, what you'll usually get is just your P&L and your SFP. And you have to prepare the cash flow statement from there. But if we kind of understand how these P&L and SFP figures were prepared in the first place from these tier counts, we know that each tier count generally just summarizes what was the SFP brought forward and carried forward amount, what was the amounts recorded in the year, and therefore the cash is just the other figure. So when you're preparing the financial statements, you're usually working out your carry forward balance rather than your cash balance. They normally give you the cash balance. But here in these cash flow questions, they give you the brought forward, the current year movements and the carried forward balance, and you're working out the cash. So you're not doing anything different from when you prepare the financial statements other than the missing figure that you're trying to work out is different. It's not just a carried forward balance. And we'll demonstrate this by working through this example and looking at lots of exam questions. So actually in terms of like technical content to learn, there isn't really anything new with a cash flow statement. It's just looking at what we already know, but from a different angle. We're usually looking at how do we prepare the number for the P&L or the SFP. And therefore the cash figures given in the question here, they've given us the P&L and the SFP. So the figure we're working out is the cash. But there isn't anything you know, different here. As I say, we're just looking at the same accounting amounts, but just from a different angle. We're working out a different balancing figure, if you like, than we usually are. So it isn't any more difficult. So as we've got these three sections in our cash flow statement, we can think you know, what's the best way to, to go through them and what's the exam technique we should use. So as I said in the exam, you'll be presented with a P&L and an SFP and you'll be asked to prepare the cash flow statement. So what's the best way to go about this? As we said, we've got our operating, investing and financing. But it makes sense to start with our operating activities. Now the indirect method, which is the method which is nearly always required in all accounting exams, and the one that you'll most often see in practice, is to actually start with the accounting profit. 
So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, well, we need to work out our cash from operations. We know what our accounting profit is, but we need to work out how much cash was actually received and paid out by the business. So we know the accounting profit is 220. Now the problem, the reason why this isn't just the cash figure, and by starting with that figure, if we don't make any adjustments, that's kind of what we're assuming. So because we're starting with that figure, our kind of default assumption, if you like, is that, well, the actual cash received is just the same as the accounting profit. Now we know that probably isn't the case, and we know it definitely isn't the case in, in this example, is because not all of the amounts, so not all of the incomes included here, and all of the expenses included, were actually a cash payment. We know that some of this revenue didn't actually result in cash coming into the business because 300 of it was sold on credit. We know this admin cost isn't actually a cash expense because it includes a depreciation charge, which isn't a cash amount. It's just an accounting amount writing off the cost of an asset which was purchased in a previous period. This other income is what we've earned in the year, but it might not necessarily result within cash coming into us, like with the finance costs. We said you've got this loan balance where you pay 3% interest or you incur 3% interest, but you might not have paid your 3% interest yet. So therefore, by starting with this accounting profit, we've kind of assumed that all these amounts which have been included in arriving at that number are actually cash amounts, but we know they're not because this is all prepared on a cruise basis. So what we do is we start with this amount and then we add back all the amounts which are non-cash expenses or deduct any income which isn't cash. So you could, of course, do it the other way and instead just start with actually your cash coming in minus your cash going out and start at the top and say that we know that um, our cash coming in from sales was 200 and our cash going out for our purchases and you could work it out that way that's a direct method but we use the indirect method rather than starting at the top and including the cash that's come in minus all the cash that's gone out we start here with this default position that everything here is cash and then you add back all the non-cash amounts you'll get to the same answer it's just you're starting with what's the cash coming in minus the cash going out here we'll just add back for the amounts which weren't cash items so therefore we've included everything here so we could just look up the PL and say which of these were non-cash items well, we can see, we know these finance costs, for example, that might not have been the cash actually paid. Because we know we debited finance expenses because that's the expense for the year, but we didn't pay it. That's why we credited interest payable. So that wasn't the amount that was actually paid. So therefore, we're going to add that back because we've said our cash from operations is just the same as our accounting profit. Well, it's not, it will be higher because the accounting profit deducted 30 here, but that wasn't actually a cash amount. So if that's not a cash amount, then the cash we actually paid, then our cash from operations will be higher than the accounting profit. The accounting profit deducted 30, but if we're just trying to work out what the cash was and that wasn't an amount paid out as cash, it's gonna be paid in the later period and that would be our cash from operations. Similarly here, we've got this other income. So we said that we've got other income of 50, so we earned income of 50, but again, that could be the same thing. Maybe we made a loan of 1,000, a 5% interest rate, and effectively we're earning interest of 50 every year, but maybe they pay the interest in arrears. Maybe they pay us you know, a year after the interest is actually accrued. So therefore we included this income of 50, even though we didn't actually receive cash of 50. So to go from our profit to our cash figure, we're then gonna deduct 
the other income because that wasn't actually a cash amount. And then you could keep doing that up the P&L, but the problem we have, of course, is that admin will probably include lots of amounts. So in our simple example, it only included depreciation. So you could then add the depreciation back because that's not a cash amount. But of course, in reality, admin expenses are going to include a lot more than just depreciation. It's going to have wages and salaries and rent and all sorts of different costs. Now, a lot of those amounts will be where the cash is actually being paid. Because if it hasn't, then we're going to see an accrued expense or a prepayment on the balance sheet. And we'll deal with that when we work through the balance sheet. So we know most companies will own assets. And if they've got assets on the SFP, we know they own assets. And therefore, we think, well, there'll be a depreciation charge in here. Now, depreciation charge, of course, isn't a cash expense. You just bought an asset um, you know, a year ago, or it could be several years ago, and then you're going to record it as an expense over several years. But no cash is being paid out this year. And that depreciation charge has reduced our profit. So therefore, we're going to need to add that back. So in our example, it's quite easy to see what that depreciation charge was because that was the only amount in admin expenses. But of course, we could work this out because if we know that our PPE has got a brought forward balance of a thousand, if we know that there were cash additions of the year of 200 and we know that the carried forward amount is 1,100, If we know all of these balances in our T account, then that depreciation figure must be 100. Because if you don't have this figure, then you can see your T account doesn't balance, your depreciation charge must be 100. So that's how you can work it out. If you know how to account for assets, you've got your bought forward on your debit side because it's an asset. When you buy assets, it causes it to go up. Then you have your depreciation charge, which reduces it to get you to your carried forward balance. So usually you're used to working out the carried forward balance for your SFP. All we're doing here is we know the carried forward balance for the SFP. So we're just working out the balancing figure, the depreciation charge. Of course, rather than presenting the assets as a single carrying amount, they could have presented it with separate amounts for cost and separate amounts for accumulated depreciation. So if you knew your accumulated depreciation was nil and your carried forward accumulated depreciation is 100, then there must have been depreciation in the year of 100. Nice and easy. So that's how you can work out your depreciation charge. You'll know that'll be an expense in the P&L. We know it's a non-cash amount. So to turn our accounting profit into the cash amount, the cash that was actually received in the year rather than just the accruals profit, then you would need to add that back because it was deducted in arriving at that profit. So it was a non-cash expense. So to turn this income figure into cash income, you'd need to add back that expense. So that's the first thing we do. We start with our PBT and we kind of work up the PL as we did there, thinking what expenses have been deducted in arriving at this profit which weren't cash expenses, they're just accruals. And equally, what income is included in here which wasn't cash income, just accruals. So your classic ones are depreciation and impairment of an asset, which of course, an impairment of an asset is just kind of like accelerated depreciation, you debit. The p l and you credit the asset to reduce it you could also have a profit or loss on disposal so if you had a loss on disposal included in your p l then you've reduced your profit but of course that loss on disposal isn't a cash amount if you sell an asset and we know when we look at assets when you sell an asset you have your proceeds minus your carrying amount equals your profit or loss on disposal so if you sell an asset for 100, it's got a carrying amount of 20, you'll have a profit or loss, a profit on disposal of 80. Or if it had a carrying amount of 120, you'd have a loss of 20. But the cash amount is the proceeds it was received for. 
this profit or loss on disposal is just the difference between the cash and their carrying amount on the balance sheet, which again is just an accruals amount because that's made up of the cost minus by the accumulated depreciation on that asset. So maybe it had a cost of 200 and accumulated depreciation of 80 to get to its carrying amount. So because it's got depreciation in there, this carrying amount is just an accruals amount because it includes that depreciation amount and that historic cost. So any profit or loss on disposal you've got in your P&L, again, isn't a cash amount. So therefore you would have to add it back. If it's a profit on disposal, then that's increased your profit and it's increased your profit, but it's a non-cash amount. So therefore you're going to need to reduce the profit to get it back to the cash amount. So therefore you deduct it like we did with this other income because that is income, which isn't a cash amount. When you've got an expense, which isn't a cash amount, you're going to need to add it back to get back to, to turn your accounting profit into a cash figure. So of course, they might not give you all of the figures. They may tell you that you've got your proceeds. They might tell you what the proceeds are. And therefore, you're gonna to have to work out what the carrying amount is to get to the profit or loss on disposal. But of course, your carrying amount is just gonna come from your asset T accounts. So you'd have to have like a disposal amount here and a disposal amount here in your accumulated depreciation if they've showed the two accounts separately or if they've showed it as a single asset amount so they showed it net of the cost and the accumulated depreciation then you'd have your disposal amount here you'd have your disposal carrying amount and therefore they'd either have to give you the profit or loss on disposal so you could work out the proceeds or they'll give you the proceeds so you can work out the profit or loss on disposal If they give you the two accounts separately, the cost and the accumulated depreciation separately, then you could work out the cost of the asset disposed of and the accumulated depreciation of the asset disposed of to get to its carrying amount. You've got its carrying amount, so therefore you can look at the difference between its carrying amount and its proceeds to get to the profit or loss on disposal. So of course, you can only ever have one balancing figure in a T account. So we saw here that depreciation was a balancing figure so if that's the case, it'd have to give you the other two. You can never have two balancing figures in a T account because there'd be an infinite number of possibilities to make it balance. And we'll see this in some of the exam questions. So therefore we'll see our profit or loss on disposal. As we've seen finance costs and investment income are also typical ones we'd need to Add back because you can see those they have their own separate line on the p l so it's easy to adjust for those ones so you just assume that this is an accruals amount so you add it back similarly with your investment income we'll just adjust for those so if that's income you're going to need to deduct it if that's an expense you're going to need to add it back to turn this from accounting income to a cash income so therefore that's the first thing we do in our cash flow question. Now, of course, we know there's other amounts in our P&L. We know that some of our revenue wasn't sold for cash. We know that some of it was sold on credit. We know some of our cost of sales, which will be our opening inventory plus our purchases. Some of our purchases may have been on credit. So therefore, we're gonna to need to adjust for those as well. But the way we do this is rather than going into the, the revenue amounts, we'll just look at receivables and payables. It's just easier to look at. But if receivables have gone up, that means some of the sales in this year were on credit. If payables have gone up, that means some of the purchases were on credit. So therefore we can just look at our receivables balance and we can see that, well, receivables have gone up by 200. So the next thing we do is we work through the current assets and current liabilities section of the SFP to calculate the year on year movements. So we can look at receivables first of all and be like, well, have receivables gone up? Well, yes, they have. So then we can kind of think, well, 
is that good for cash? Does that mean that our revenue was all cash or does it mean that actually, you know, that wasn't so good for cash? Now, we know that if your receivables have gone up, that kind of means that rather than your customers paying you for sales, they bought them on credit. So that's kind of bad for cash. So therefore we'll show that as a cash outflow. And we've shown that it's 200. So that's how we do that in the exam. If we actually just think about what's it showing, if we know that our receivables were 550 brought forward, we made sales in the year of 300 on credit, our customers actually paid us 100, then we can see that we made 300 of our revenue, which is included in our PBT, is actually credit sales. So therefore we're like adjusting for that 300, but then actually they actually paid as 100, or some of these bought forward receivables paid as 100. Therefore the overall impact from credit sales in the current year is 200. But it's easier probably to just do the common sense approach rather than overthinking it like that. Do the common sense approach and just be like, well, receivables went up, so that's bad for cash. If receivables had gone down, that's good for cash because customers have paid you the money they've owed you, so therefore you must have cash coming in. We can look at payables and payables have gone up. Payables have gone up by 150. Is that good for cash or bad for cash? Well, if payables had gone down, then we would have paid money out to our suppliers to pay that liability, to pay them what we owe them. So that would be bad for cash. So actually, if payables have gone up, that kind of means that rather than paying our suppliers, we've instead bought the goods on credit, so we haven't actually paid them the cash yet, so that's good for cash. So therefore, we'll have our payables cash increase of 150. And again, you could think of this as well, we deducted all of our cost of sales from when calculating our profit, so our PBT includes this 200 of cost of sales, which includes that 150 of purchases in the year, opening inventory plus purchases. And we deducted that from the profit, but actually those purchases, we didn't actually pay for them in cash. So to turn this to our kind of overall cash inflow number, you would need to add back that expense. But again, a common sense approach is probably the easiest. Look at receivables, look at payables. Is it gone up or down? Is that good or bad for cash? And then we've got inventories. So we saw that opening inventories were 50, closing inventories were zero. So inventories have gone down. Is that good for cash or bad for cash? Well, if you think about it the other way around, if inventories had gone up, would that be good or bad for cash? Well, that would mean that we've got money tied up in our closing inventory. So that would be bad. So therefore inventories going down must be good for cash. So therefore we could get down to our cash from operations. So just to recap on our technique there, start with the PBT, work up the P&L to adjust out all of these accruals that were included in this PBT figure. So we've started with the PBT figure and then adjusting for all the accrued amounts in here. So we're only left with just the cash amounts. That's what we've done there. So the next bit is to work out the tax and interest we actually paid. So if we look at our interest, first of all, so we added back our interest. We started with our PBT and we then added this back. We said this is an accruals amount. Well, if that's the accrued expense, what interest did we actually pay? So we know from our balance sheet that we've got our interest payable at the end of last year was 120. And we know at the end of this year, it's 100. So we had our interest payable at the start of the year of 120. That would have then increased because we had this additional interest payable. So we had this finance expense of 30, which we haven't paid. So that gets added on to what we owe. So that gets added on to our liability. And if we know that the carried forward is only 100, then we must have paid something. We must have paid that because otherwise, if we hadn't paid it, our carried forward would be 150. If our carried forward is only 100, we must have paid 50. 
and that's how you get that T account to balance. Brought forward 120, the liability increased in the year because we incurred some more interest that we haven't paid. So therefore it would have been 150. If it ends up at only 100, you must have paid 50. And therefore we'd have our interest paid, which we actually paid out of 50. And we can do the same thing for tax. Now remember we started with profit before tax, so therefore we didn't have to add back the accrued tax expense because we started with this figure. So again, we know that our tax expense for the year was 44. We know that our liability at the start of the year was 50. So therefore our tax payable at the start of the year was 50. That's what we owed them for previous years. It's then gone up by 44 because we've incurred some more tax in this year because we've earned some profits. But our carried forwards balance is only 44. So therefore we must have paid 50. Otherwise your T account won't balance. So therefore you must have paid 50 to get you to that carried forward balance. Brought forward liability. The liability increased because of the amounts incurred in the year. That should equal the carried forward. If it doesn't, you must have paid some of your liability. So it also paid tax of 50. That'll get us to our net cash from operations. So that was the next step. Work through the tax interest actually paid. So the tax and interest actually paid. And then we can move on to our investing. And we said that our investing activities related to our assets, investing money we've spent, you know, buying things, um, buying assets to earn future income. That's what investing is. So what we're focusing on here is our asset section. Now the way we account for PP and intangibles is exactly the same. So you'd approach these two in exactly the same way. The only difference is the nature of the assets, but the way we account for them is exactly the same. And of course we call amortization of intangibles amortization, whereas we call it exactly the same thing on tangibles depreciation, but they are essentially the same thing, writing off the cost of the asset over its useful life. So therefore you can look as we've already looked at this when we calculated our depreciation. So again, maybe the exam question will tell you, or you'll know the brought forward and you'll know the carried forward from the SFP. Maybe it would tell you that depreciation was 100 and therefore the cash additions will be your balancing figure. Or maybe it would tell you what the cash additions were and then depreciation is the balancing figure. They can only ever make you have one balancing figure. Otherwise there's an infinite number of possibilities you could have for these two. So therefore we know our cash additions. So our purchase of PPE in the year, that's obviously a cash outflow. There we are. Now, if you had sold PPE, as we mentioned earlier, that would be a cash inflow. So again, we could have worked out what the profit on disposal figures were, and then we'd have the proceeds from selling PPE is of course a cash inflow. So you'd adjust for the profit or loss on disposal, that accrued figure, when turning your accounting profit back into a cash figure, but actually selling it and receiving the cash is a cash inflow under investing activities. But again, you can see there's nothing new technically here because you have to be able to work out a profit or loss on disposal when you're looking at assets questions anyway. So we're just picking up the cash amount, which we don't normally use because we're used to preparing the P&L and the SFP. But we're just looking at this now from a different angle, but everything's the same. We're just using the cash numbers for a change where we don't, do that when we're using the PL, when we're preparing the PL and the SFP. So we can look at any interest received or, or income received. So we know that we had this other income of 50. So we need to know the cash amount that was actually received. Now, if we look at this on our SFP, 
we can see that we don't have any you know, other income receivable or interest receivable brought forward and carried forward. Therefore, the brought forward and carried forward must be nil. If the brought forward is nil, so if you think about any of our, our other accounts, if we know that the brought forward is nil, and we know that the carried forward is nil, but we know that you earned income in the year, so therefore we would have gone debit the amount we're expecting to receive and we've credited the P&L, then the amount we receive must be the cash amount because there is no brought forward and carried forward asset or liability. If it was unpaid and that wasn't a cash amount, that wasn't equal to the cash amount, then we'd have an asset or liability on our SFP, but we don't. So therefore the bought forward nil, the carried forward nil, this was the income, the accrued amount, but that must also equal the cash amount because if it didn't, you'd have an asset on your SFP. So therefore our interest received was actually the 50 that was accrued. It just so happened that the amount we accrued is the same as the cash amount. We didn't just dump a cash amount in the P&L, but it just so happened that the accrued amount was the same as the cash amount. And that would be the case if there's no brought forward or carried forward. So then we've got our cash from investing activities. And then as we said, we'll come on to our liabilities and equities we've done our non-current assets. We started off with our P&L, we started with PBT, adjusted for everything, adding it back. We then went through our current assets and liabilities, our current assets and liabilities to deal with our working capital section. So receivables, inventories, payables, etc., tax and interest. So we've done all of this now. So that just leaves our liabilities and our equity. So investing was looking really at our assets. Here we're looking at our liability and equity. So we can go through each of these amounts. The things we're gonna see here would be any share issues which resulted in cash coming into the company, any dividends paid out to shareholders, and you can see those being paid out from retained earnings. So we don't have anything with borrowings, but if borrowings had gone up, let's say they'd gone up from zero to 100, then the company's got debt of 100, it's borrowed money of 100, that means it must have some cash inflow somebody's lent as 100, so you'd have income from loans or proceeds from loans of, of 100. It would be the double entry would be credit, liability, debit cash. So now we can think about shares. We had share capital of 2000, it's gone up to 2100. We must have issued shares. So has a cash amount been received? Well, if it isn't a bonus issue, then the answer is yes. Bonus issue is where we issue shares, but we don't receive any cash. It's a bonus for the shareholders. So if our share capital started at 2,000, it's gone up to 2,100, we must have issued shares. If it wasn't a bonus issue, it must be for cash. Now we can also see our share premium went up. If our share premium's gone up, then the amount that they paid for the shares, the shareholders paid for the shares, is above the nominal amount. So therefore, they would always have to pay the nominal amount, but they've also paid a premium on top. So therefore, you can see the total amount of cash that was received was 150. Again, you've got your brought forward, you've got your carried forward. If you don't have this cash issue in here, you know, they don't agree. That's what caused it to go up. You know the double entry for an issue of shares. We covered it in the equity class. You're going to credit share capital because there's more equity in a company because the shareholders have put more money in for the shares. And of course, you'll debit cash. So therefore, we've got our proceeds from issue of shares here. So we can tick that one off. And then the only thing we've got left to deal with now is our retained earnings. So we can think, are, are there any cash amounts in retained earnings? And what are retained earnings? Retained earnings, of course, are just the profits from all the previous years. So retained earnings brought forward is the profit from the previous years. Retained earnings carried forward is retained earnings from all the previous years, you know, plus the current year, 
to get us to our carried forward retained earnings. Retained earnings is just the accumulated profits that have been made and not paid out as dividends. So in our retained earnings, we can see that we've got our brought forward, which will be a credit because it's a credit account, it's an equity account. Retained earnings would have gone up by the profit for the year. The profit for the year is transferred from the P&L into retained earnings. This is just for a single year. And then we get our year end SFP. So the P&L ends up, you know, there's nothing. It's just showing the movements for a year. And therefore we end up with our retained earnings carried forward. So your retained earnings brought forward plus your profit, you'd expect to equal your retained earnings carried forward. But of course, we can see here that they don't. Our retained earnings brought forward plus our profit for the year equals 1676, but the carry forward is this. Therefore, a dividend must have been paid out where you debit retained earnings because it reduces retained earnings because those earn uh, earnings are no longer retained in the company. They've actually been paid out to the shareholders who they belong to. So your debit retained earnings in credit cash because you're paying the money out of the company to the shareholders. So therefore, dividends paid is 100. And therefore, we get to our cash from financing activities. So our cash from our operations was 200. So we cash came in of 200. We spent 150 on investing activities, mainly purchasing PPE. And then we raised an additional 50 from financing activities by issuing shares. And therefore our cash had gone up by 100. So we can see what the cash brought forward amount was at the start of the year, 2420. So we said it was this plus it was 2420 brought forward. We brought in cash of 100 in the year. Therefore, that should give us our cash carried forward balance, which is, of course, what we see on our SFP. So that's when you know you've done a cash flow statement correct. So this is the exam technique to use. Now, it could be, depending on the exam question, you could possibly do multiple parts at the same time. For example, when we looked at assets, you know, you may work out your cash additions and your depreciation at the same time. And you know that the depreciation charge goes in when you're looking at your cash flow from operating activities because you need to add it back to the accounting profit because it's a non-cash expense when we're turning that accounting profit into the cash amount. If you've actually looked at that T account, then you may have identified what your cash additions are. So therefore, you may think, well, I may as well just go and pop that in now, even though that goes in investing. So you may put that in at the same time. And you could even have had perhaps a profit or loss on disposal as well. And therefore, you may have worked out some of those figures and you may as well think, oh, I'll put that in my investing while I do my operating at the same time. That's one way of doing it. And it's fine if you want to do it that way, whatever way you find quickest. But we'll see the different approaches when we work through the various exam questions. I think the most important thing to kind of come out from this is that you appreciate that we're not doing anything new here with the cash flow statement. We're just kind of looking at how we prepared our financial statements, but we're just doing something different here. You're so used to preparing the P&L and the SFP, you can quite easily work out what goes on in the P&L and the SFP. But of course, when you did that, you always included like a cash number. It's just it was quite insignificant because you're always trying to calculate either the SFP numbers or the P&L numbers. But here they give you the P&L and the SFP numbers and you're just working out the cash number. But if you know your double entry, then this is, this is quite, quite easy. There's nothing technically new with a cash flow statement. As I keep saying, it's just looking at it from a different angle. Particularly with like asset accounting, you know, you know, how to account for assets, how to work out your, your carrying amounts, you know, your depreciation, etc. cetera. Uh, 
And of course, you know, the assets just additions cause it to go up, depreciation causes it to go down, disposals causes it to go down. You know how to calculate a profit or loss on disposal. When you sell an asset, it's just a number we're mainly going to use here is the proceeds figure, which you wouldn't normally use anywhere in the financial statements in the PL and the SFP. So we're just picking up numbers which we wouldn't use in our PL and our SFP, but they are numbers we use in calculating our PL and SFP figures. So we're not doing anything technically new here, as I keep saying, we're just looking at it from a different angle. So once you kind of take that on board and appreciate that, these should actually become quite easy.